Um, but other than that, that's everything from me. So I will happily be quiet now and hand over to our first speaker of the day, who is dietitian Alison Barnes. Thank you, Charlie, and, and welcome everybody. Um, so to start the session off this morning, um, we're going to think a little bit about the, the discussion that we had online prior to the event. Now, the question that we posed was asking about how our eating habits had, had changed during the lockdown. Um, and there's, there's, there's reasons around why we were asking that that I'll come on to. But I actually want to start with, um, with a poll question because obviously not everybody was, was a part of that discussion. So I want to get a general idea of how things might have changed during what, you know, what's been a, 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 some very strange times um, for all of us but, um, and had a lot of impacts and, and including on how, how we might eat day to day. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to ha actually have to say um, I might need some, some uh, technical assistance because I can't see my normal um, share screen at the bottom. Charlie, would you be able to share my slides for me, please? Perfect. Okay. So as you can see, we have the poll question up there. How have your each ha eating habits changed since lockdown began? Can you see the results there, Alison? I can. Do you think that's everybody? That's everyone, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for participating. So, so in terms of, of all of us on the call and the event this morning, the, the majority, 56% of people, have managed to maintain their eating ha habits um, during lockdown. But there is some variety within that. Um, and so um, for almost a third, um, they've become healthier, which is really good news as well. It'll be interesting to hear about. And for some people, for 15%, um, they've become a bit less healthy. Um, so I'm just going to, um, can we get rid of the poll off the screen there, Charlie? You should be able to just X out of it if it's, if it's still showing up on your screen. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So just to give a bit more background to myself. So I'm, I'm as Charlie said, um, a dietitian. I'm a lecturer in human nutrition and dietetics at Newcastle University. Um, my background is as a diabetes specialist dietitian. Um, and I, was, I, I am and have been a senior research dietitian for, for a Newcastle University study called DIRECT that I'm going to talk about um, in a little while. Um, I'm a Diabetes UK clinical champion, um, which means that I, I work for improving diabetes care locally. Um, and I'm also a, a judge for the, the annual um, Quick Diabetes Awards as well, which looks at, at um, innovative practice for improving diabetes care. So in today's session, we're, we're starting with the poll and I'll come on to that in a second. Um, I'm going to talk about our research into type 2 diabetes remission and the direct study. Um, talk about how that's now being translated into the NHS um, and into um, general practice. Um, and then think a bit about how we maintain long-term dietary changes that we may have seen some short-term changes during lockdown, um, but how do we maintain the longer-term changes? So perhaps just before we start, it's really nice if people are able to, to participate a little bit. So maybe we could have someone to share an example perhaps of how their eating habits have become healthier, and then someone to share if they're happy to what's helped them to maintain their eating habits and also someone who feels their eating habits have become a bit less healthy. Um, there's no obligation to share, but if you would like to, if you could raise your hand um, and Charlie could maybe select um, two or three people that we'll just um, get some feedback from. And then I'll, I'll give you an overview of what came up in the discussion online as well. Um, so we have Alex Bug who has raised his hand, so we'll go to him first. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, morning, everyone. Morning. Um, so yeah, I said that I think mine has um, stayed relatively similar. Um, and I think what, what's helped me, to be honest with that, is um, because of social distancing and restrictions on going outside, um, my office was on a, a fairly busy main road so oftentimes um, I'd be kind of nipping out and 
you know, pick something up from the shop or get asked out for a cup of coffee and, piece, you know, occasional snack or piece of cake or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, you know, typically would sort of take in prepared lunches and things as well. Um, and then having to sort of go back to less leaving the house, um, one, one weekly shop, um, having to plan meals a little bit more because I knew I wouldn't be able to, to go out as much. Um, and initially, probably the, the snacks and things were maybe a bit less and I was eating about the same. And then gradually, um, you know, started to realise, oh, well, if I do want the odd treat here and there, I need to get it in that one weekly shop because I can't be nipping out to the shops all, all the time. Um, so I'd say really things have stayed um, about the same. You know, in terms of my staple kind of breakfast, lunch and, and dinner, um, they, they've stayed pretty similar. Um, and then, yeah, sort of snacking habits and you stay pretty, pretty similar as well. Yeah, so really interesting points. And I think you make a very good point about the kind of, you know, when, when we were out more out and about, that we're, we're, we're almost faced with a lot more opportunity or a lot more temptation or, or situations where we might eat. Because um, we make thousands of decisions a day, something like 35,000 decisions a day. We make over 200 decisions, usually in our usual situation, that are just about food alone. Um, and every time, you know, you're passing a shop or someone offers you, you some cake or you, you know, you go for coffee with a friend or whatever, they're all decisions that we're making about whether to have something to eat, what to have. Um, so, so in some ways, you know, the lockdown has, has removed some of those, some of those decisions. Um, but as you say, things like meals and meal planning have become, become more prominent for, for a lot of people. Thanks, Alex. Um, anyone where their eating habits have changed during lockdown, so either more or less healthy? Um, so we have a couple of other hands up. Uh, Stella? Did you want to add anything? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, before before lockdown, um, I was dieting because I was overweight anyway, <clears throat> and I'd um, I'd lost a stone and a half, which I was absolutely thrilled with, and it wasn't a problem. I was on a regular diet. Um, eating healthily and then lockdown came and I live alone and I thought well I'm on my own and I deserve a little treat um, so I gave myself a little treat and then I began having a daily treat and then two a day um, so after about three or four weeks I thought I'd better weigh myself and I weighed myself and thought thought, oh, I, I'll have gained loads of weight. In fact, I'd only gained one pound. So I was delighted that I'd only gained one pound with all of these treats. So I continued to give myself treats. So the treats have just multiplied, I'm afraid. Um, and I haven't been on the scales for about three weeks now. So I am going to get on. When my treats are finished, when the cupboard's bare, I'm going to get on the scales again. And if I've gained any more, I'm planning to go back to the healthy eating and not have the treats. That sounds like a really good plan. And I have to say, you know, very well done for, for the changes that you'd made before lockdown. Um, and do you know what? It's one of the themes that came out in the chats and you'll see in my slide in a moment is the, the kind of snacking and also food as treats, you know, for various reasons that actually... Um, food is sometimes about the way that we that we cope with things. Um, you know, if we're if we're feeling a little bit down or or or, or on our own, um, and also you know because we're in the house more often as well. And and if they're there, and you know we we we, we see them, and we that gives us a, a a trigger, if you like, to remind us oh the biscuits are there, let's have something. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like you've got a good plan there, Stella, in terms of. You know, <laughs> Let's evaluate what's happened and, and take it from there. So that, that, all sound, that all sounds great. You know, Thank you. you know, the treats have been in there. Great. Okay. And how about anyone whose who's eating habits have actually improved during lockdown? Um, another hand raised is uh, Irene Salsby. You want to go? Hello, everybody. Um, it was just sort of adding on to what already has been said. Um, my other half, he really likes to cook and I think he does it for relaxation and he cooks lots of things, things from scratch. Um, because we're both in the house, we tend to eat more of the, well, we're very sort of conscious about um, waste. 
and um, we seem to sort of make new dishes out of the leftovers or eat them on a more regular basis you know instead of having a sandwich if you were going out um, there's always something else uh, that way um, I would just say as well we sort of increase the um, purchasing of the multi-packs of crisps I think it's all right if you have a small pack because at least you know what you're eating. The trouble is you sort of get big packs of Doritos and you have absolutely no control on what you've actually eaten there. Um, I must admit I'm fond of a treat of chocolate, but we're, uh, well, I'm the chocolate eater in the house and I'm still eating some of the Christmas stash. And I, sometimes I feel as if if I want to try and take the edge off things, especially I don't think this is this session is going to talk about drinking. Um, but to, if I have a diet tonic on the night time, that seems to put me off um, wanting to have a glass of wine. So I try and have wine just like two or three times a week and the diet tonic does fine. And I feel as if I've had a nice drink there. So that Absolutely. was it for me. Oh, thanks, Irene. That's fantastic. And I, I do the, the very same with the diet tonic. You can imagine there's a there's a little gin in there somewhere. Uh, it gives you it gives you the same the same taste. Um, but that's yeah, that's I think that's one of the things that's come out as well. And in fact, I will move on to my slide. The, the themes that came out of the discussion, um, the positive changes. Um, Eating was the, the highlight of the day for some people because, you know, you're in the house and, and what you're going to have for the meal becomes, becomes more of the focus. So actually not having those busy lives and, and going out to work all the time has made it easier um, for people to come up with kind of creative and healthy meal choices and the planning and the, the finding things in the back of, that were lurking in the back of the cupboard and making something interesting out of it um, came out as a theme as well. Um, but you know, when I, when I see people in practice, one of, one of the struggles is, is finding the time to make healthy meals because people are, you know, on the go all the time. Um, we have such busy lives. So it's kind of, it's giving some people a bit more time and space. Um, considering others came out as well. And that was a, a really nice aspect of it. So neighbors were, were bringing people food. People were considering, you know, their family and the burden that their family were, were having when they were, when they were ordering their shopping and, and their family were bringing that and they were specifically ordering less um, and being more careful about meals um, from that point of view and other people considering you know local businesses when they were when they were ordering and um, getting milk and things delivered um, so there were some really considerate aspects to this as well um, some people were spending less money um, and some people had, had, had lost weight when when they previously um, been, had gained some weight prior to lockdown um, the more negative um, changes that came up so shopping challenges um, which we've all found and Alex mentioned there that you know having to, to change to a weekly shop but also people who've been you know um, isolating in the house as well um, or shielding and not not able to go out um, less social eating um, which um, Stella mentioned as well you know if you're if you're on your own and you're in the house on your own and that came up for other people um, you know you're not getting those social aspects of going out um, and having meals or or meeting up with friends um, where eating is involved. Um, the snacking we've already mentioned and, and the biscuits were the big culprit um, in that one. Um, some people actually spent more money um, and some people gain, gained weight. Um, and you know, what I should have said in the weight loss was that actually main, you know, just keeping your weight steady um, is, is a, good, a, a good outcome as well. Um, and some people had seen some, some weight gain though. Um, and then in terms of not changing very much breakfast, kind of the meals that we've always eaten and, you know, there was some Newcastle University research a while ago that showed people um, ate the same breakfast as an adult that they had when they were a child. It's one of the things that, that stayed quite steady. Um, people were managing to maintain their fruit and veg intake, which is fantastic. Um, and then there was challenges of people with a variety of dietary needs um, within the household and people were finding, you know, ways to cope with that. And some people were having meals delivered from companies that, that could meet those different requirements as well. And long standing healthy habits seem to be a good way of being able to just keep those habits going in lockdown. And that's something I think to take away from the discussion is that if we're in good habits, um, within our everyday lives, then when something goes goes awry or something changes, that that we're more likely to be able to to maintain those habits. Um, so thinking about um, lockdown, though obviously the reason for that has been COVID nineteen, um, and I don't want to go into too too much detail in terms of the figures, but what we know from from the data that's 
coming out um, about people who have had COVID-19 is that while being overweight or obese and having diabetes may not increase your chances of catching the virus, that's you know much to do with the advice that we're all asked to follow about social distancing and hand washing, etc. Um, but it does does increase the likelihood of having a poorer outcome um, when people have COVID-19. Now there's lots of kind of complicated reasons around that and around the data to do with the populations that, that may be more overweight and, and that may be more likely to, to have diabetes. Um, but it does mean that there's now a big focus on both of those things, on obesity and on diabetes. Um, and certainly there's been quite a lot of coverage in the media recently. So I wanted to just talk to you briefly um, about a study that, that we've done at Newcastle University, which also had um, quite a lot of media coverage over the last, the last few years. Um, so, and it's related to type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is, is becoming ever more prevalent. Um, so over 6% of the population now have it. Um, one person's diagnosed every three minutes in England and Wales. Um, and it costs the NHS over 10% um, of its total budget every year. Um, and there's also cost to the individual person in terms of their health, in terms of the stigma of, have, of being labelled as having diabetes, um, greater insurance costs and, you know, having to go regularly and spend time sitting in, in GP waiting rooms and things like that. So we always considered type 2 diabetes, which is that which 9 out of 10 people who have diabetes have type 2, to be a lifelong progressive condition. So something that starts with dietary control, moves through needing tablets, to medications where we need to check blood glucose and then half of people after they've had type 2 diabetes for 10 years need, need insulin therapy which is an injection therapy um, to control their blood glucose levels. But we knew from, from people having weight loss surgery that actually type 2 diabetes could go away quite quickly um, with weight loss and sometimes even before people had lost an awful lot of weight. And so studies from Newcastle University wanted to look at whether the same thing was achievable to put type two diabetes into remission, but using diet rather than having weight loss surgery. Um, so, Professor Roy Taylor is the professor at Newcastle University who has led this research and looked at the mechanisms of type 2 diabetes reversal. And what he discovered with some early studies was if people are able to lose about two and a half stone, we strip out unhealthy fat that's built up in their organs, so in the liver and the pancreas in particular, and that can put type 2 diabetes into remission where people have normal blood glucose levels without needing to take any medication. And that was combined with research at Glasgow University, Professor Mike Lean, who had done some research trying to deliver a weight management program to achieve that level of weight loss in a primary care setting, which is where most people with type 2 diabetes have their care. So this study, it was joint between the two universities and it was funded by Diabetes UK. And at the time it was the biggest ever research grant that they'd awarded. So it was over three million pounds of funding. So DIRECT stands for the Diabetes Remission Clinical Trial. Um, so it was randomized by GP practice. We had 149 people in the diet arm and 149 in the control arm who just had their usual care. Um, it was people with diabetes of up to six years um, duration because we knew that shorter duration diabetes meant it was more likely to be able to, to reverse the underlying problems. Um, and also people who weren't um, taking insulin at the time. And on the right hand side, we recruited um, this fairly typical population for type 2 diabetes. The majority were male and that's, that's, it reflects um, type 2 diabetes in the population, but it's very unusual for a weight management study where usually the vast majority um, are, are female participants. Um, a fifth of our participants were from the most um, deprived areas um, in England and Scotland and their, their age um, and body mass index 55-35 and were fairly typical for type 2 diabetes. It was a predominantly white British population so 98% of the population were white in the direct study. So this was the approach that we used. So in GP practices and it was practice nurse or dietitian delivering this um, so people saw their usual practice nurse and there are three steps to this program so step one is a total diet replacement now those four they're, they're supposed to represent um, milkshakes um, so it's four meal replacement drinks a day so it's a milkshake or a soup 
four of those with a fibre supplement and some fluids to replace everything else in the diet. So a slight more significant change than what, than what we've been talking about. And it's about 800 calories a day. So it's a low calorie diet, it does require um, medical supervision. Um, and people followed that for three months. Um, and then we supported people to gradually reintroduce normal foods and to be able to build healthy meals, one meal at a time. Um, and that was very gradually over about a two month period. That's often the time that people find the most stressful is coming back to reintroducing foods. And then step three was support to keep the weight off and to maintain the positive changes. And that was up to 24 months, up to two years um, for the randomized trial. We're actually supporting the people in the intervention arm and everyone's gonna be followed up to five years and that, that work is still ongoing. Um, so although you know, people tend to focus on the low calorie diet, if you look at the time out of the two years actually that was that was a pretty short time period for me as a dietitian the study's all about food and it's about helping people to reintroduce healthier habits after they've been able to lose a significant amount of weight in a fairly short defined period um, so why would we use a liquid diet rather than food? Because you can lose that amount of weight with a food-based diet. And, you know, we always say if people are able to do that, then fantastic. You know, that's great. But some, a lot of people would struggle to do it. So these types of diet are safe and effective under the right supervision and with the right support. Um, they provide complete nutrition in very few calories. So they're about 200 calories a shake, which is less than your, your typical sandwich that you might get on the high street, um, a lot less than some of them. Um, people tend to not feel hungry, which was surprising. Um, I did a bit a week of the diet before we started. And after the first couple of days, the hunger tends to settle down, um, which, which our participants find um, very reassuring as well. Um, as a complete break from making decisions around food and for a lot of people who, who are overweight or may have struggled with their weight for a long time, um, actually deciding you know, what to eat and how much to eat can be, can be quite um, tiring and, and stressful. So, so it gave people a, a chance to step away from that. Um, there was motivation from the, the rapid weight loss. So, so sometimes when we, we give advice to lose weight slowly and gradually, that takes a, a lot of motivation over a longer period. Um, and this is kind of a different motivation than to keep the weight off. Um, it helped us to break habits. So those things that we were talking about, you know, like um, sitting down and opening the pack of Doritos and, and that was absolutely right. If, you know, a bigger pack means that you're more like, you're less likely to keep track of how much you're having. And, and I think a lot of us do it sitting in front of the TV and opening something on, on a nighttime and then you look down and it's gone. Um, and actually just because people were on shakes, they were able to break a lot of those habits. Um, it also meant that, that the triggers for eating would stand out. Those everyday things that we talked about in the discussion discussion as well that mean that you know you may go to a cake shop and have something on the way past for example um, because people knew they were on the shakes we could go back and say okay well what was going on at the time was it you know was it that you were stressed or or was it that someone offered you food and you weren't you didn't feel able to say no because those triggers are there when people go back to normal eating as well um, and then we've got this blank slate that's created by the diet. So rather than taking people's ordinary diet and, and picking it, we create new habits and build new habits from scratch. Um, and this is what a low calorie diet can do to weight loss. So this is the hairy dieters who came to open um, our, our, our new magnet at the, the Newcastle Magnetic Resonance Center. And that's our scanner behind them. They're actually scanning a globe artichoke, obviously, because they're chefs. Um, but the, on the right hand side is what you see if someone was lying in that scanner with their feet towards us. Now the left hand image is someone before one of these diets. Um, that green area you can see in the top left is the liver. Um, and a healthy liver of li level of liver fat is less than 5%. And this is someone who has 36% liver fat. And we see high levels of liver fat in people who have type 2 diabetes. In one of our early studies, this is after eight weeks um, of, a, of the liquid diet, um, and they lost two and a half stone. Um, and their, their liver fat was, was stripped right out and it was down to 2%, so a healthy level of liver fat. Um, in terms of the, the results that we saw from the study, so the red is the, the people in the, the diet group and the blue is the control group who just received their usual diabetes care at their practice. So we had a greater level of, of weight loss, both at one year and, and two years. So 10 kilograms compared to one kilogram. Um, and there was some weight regain 
um, in year two, as you can see. Um, in terms of remission of diabetes, so the little red dotty line is where we thought, sorry, that's my dog barking in the background, um, is where we thought it was a clinically significant level of remission, about 22%. And actually, we had 46% of our participants were in remission um, at one year. Um, so just under half of the people in this study. And then at two years, um, still 36%, so still over a third of people were in remission of type 2 diabetes without needing any medication. So in terms of you know, the, the cost to people um, and also the cost to the NHS as well, it offers um, you know, some significant um, options and potential for looking at type 2 diabetes in a new way and the treatment around it. And the chances of remission were very much increased um, the more weight that people lost. So generally, when, when we talk about weight loss and diabetes, we talk about, you know, lose 5% of your weight loss can be advantageous. And it can, it can help, you know, blood pressure, blood lipids um, and, and glucose levels, but not enough to strip that fat out of the organs. Um, so the more weight loss that people had, you can see the chances of them achieving remission increased um, to, to uh, you know, over, over 70%. And this is at two years. Um, and the, the take home message really was that, that if people were able to lose um, 10 kilograms, which is about a stone and a half or more, that two thirds were in remission two years um, down the line, which is great. And this was the liver fat indirect. So, so the average started at 16%. And it dropped right down to 3% after the weight loss um, and was maintained at that level to 12 months. Now, type 2 diabetes remission isn't a cure. So by having had type 2 diabetes, people are susceptible to redevelop it. And we saw this with, um, in terms of weight regain. So the red line at the top is the people who didn't achieve diabetes remission. Now, they still lost 5.8 kilograms and maintained that level of weight loss. That's still a clinically significant amount. It just wasn't enough to achieve remission. The people who lost and then, um, sorry, who achieved and then lost remission had quite a lot of weight regain, as you can see there. Um, over seven kilograms of weight regain. And then there were people who achieved remission and kept remission up to the two year point, and they still had some weight regain. We haven't tracked that yet, you know, in terms of keeping, keeping all of the weight off, but, but it wasn't enough weight regain to tip them back into diabetes. So helping people to maintain long-term dietary changes is the key thing, because otherwise the diabetes will come back. And that can be, you know, some, some of the biggest challenges that people can face. Um, in terms of, of keeping those, those healthy habits going. But the NHS are going to launch a pilot, and this is going to start um, in, on the 1st of September this year in 10 areas, um, using the approach from direct. Um, so, so prescribing these shakes with, with the appropriate support, so support um, up to a year to reintroduce the food afterwards and keep the weight off. So there's going to be 5,000 people offered this, this opportunity um, in 10 pilot sites across England. Um, and it's going to include, you know, individual appointments, group appointments, and also some digital versions as well. So, so online support to try and find out what might be the most effective and what's most helpful for people as well. So it's quite exciting to see that research um, in Newcastle University have, have, have led really um, moving now to, to a national level. Um, there's an awful lot of people involved in direct, um, lots of researchers um, and staff and clinical staff, but also, you know, our GP practices and our participants and a lot of being from the local area um, as well. We're just really, really grateful um, to them. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I was going to ask about the lockdown changes that we might keep going, but I think let's have a think about those. We can always come back to those later because I'm just aware of the time. But thank you very much, everybody, and for, for taking part in the discussion as well. I'd also like to thank my dog for being quiet because um, this is unheard of during a Zoom meeting. So um, he's done very well. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks so much for that, Arslan. That was a really fascinating um, presentation. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to move straight on to the next speaker. But if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. And I'm sure Alison will be able to pick up a couple of those and, and answer some of them in the chat, because I know that that was a really, really interesting discussion. Um, but we're going to move straight on now to the next speaker. So we're next going to hear from Professor Tom Hill. Tom, if you're if you're speaking, you might be muted at the minute. Uh, 
apologies about that. Um, okay, I hope everybody can hear me. So I'm going to talk to you about vitamin D, uh, a nutrient which has received quite a lot of attention in the last number of months, uh, again in light of lockdown and the fact that uh, we do make vitamin D in the skin upon exposure to sunlight. I'm going to talk to you about some of the research that I'm leading on coming up with uh, novel food sources of vitamin D um, and put it all in the context of um, healthy vitamin D for our bones and our muscles. Okay, so a few basics to begin. It, it's, it's fascinating to be involved in such a, a, a wide ranging field uh, involving dermatologists, medical physicists, medical doctors and nutritionists. Um, we're certainly indebted to all the work um, that dermatology has offered vitamin D research. Uh, it's the sunshine vitamin, as many of you know, um, and we make it in our skin upon ex exposure to sunlight. The trouble is in the UK for about six months of the year, um, we are unable to make vitamin D in our skin. So what you see on the slide is a, is a map of vitamin D production uh, and the amount of UV that is required to produce vitamin D. And it's clearly evident that there's a strong north-south gradient uh, in vitamin D uh, production. So we make more in the south and we make less in the north, uh, including Newcastle. Just to acknowledge Professor Anne Webb, who has been leading a lot of this um, dermal vitamin D research over the last 20 years. So I'm not going to focus on, on this very much. I'm going to focus uh, on the dietary and the supplemental forms of vitamin D and ultimately uh, how much do we need. So in 2019, believe it or not, vitamin D uh, exceeded vitamin C as the most common single use multivitamin supplement. Uh, it's quite remarkable, really, the rise in vitamin D sales over the last 10 to 15 years. Obviously, people take these supplements for many different reasons, and I hope that by the end of my brief talk that some of these will become uh, evident. But it's really important to point out that um, from a public health nutrition perspective, um, as a population in the UK, we're well away from uh, the recommendations. We're consuming no more than three to four micrograms of vitamin D per day in our diet. So what you see on the slide are typical intakes across different age groups. And the recommendation is now 10 micrograms per day, which was set in 2016 uh, by the Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition. So what you can clearly see is a very dramatic shortfall in how much we're consuming relative to how much we're advised to consume by authoritative bodies. And the use of low-dose supplements has been widely promoted by a number of bodies in the UK, including Public Health England, the Scientific Committee for Nutrition, uh, and NICE, which sets uh, a lot of the clinical evidence uh, for supplements and, and medicines in the UK. And this advice is not new. This is advice to take vitamin D supplements at 10 micrograms per day uh, has been around for the last number of years. But it's come to light recently in light of uh, the lockdown period and the fact that people aren't getting out uh, as much. Now, of course, we do get vitamin D in foods, but it's not very widespread in foods. Egg yolks are a moderate source, so um, a, an egg yolk will have about 1.6 to 1.8 micrograms, so achieving 10 micrograms would, would need six egg yolks. A uh, portion of oily fish is about 10 to 15 uh, micrograms. Uh, some in New, newly developed foods such as uh, UV irradiated mushrooms and of course vitamin D is found in, in fortified foods as well such as spreads, milks and dairy products. So intrigued by research that has shown that we can increase the vitamin D content of eggs, um, I embarked on a project with uh, the biggest egg producer in the country, Noble Foods, who own the brand Happy Egg. Um, I had a number of my colleagues at Newcastle uh, spanning consumer research um, from Sharon Kuznetsov and colleagues at DSM, which is an international supplement company. Um, and we got funding from Innovate UK to explore the commercial potential for enriching eggs with vitamin D, basically 
feeding hens additional vitamin D to see if that vitamin D translates into uh, an improved vitamin D content of, of egg. And we, we did this uh, commercial feeding trial for six weeks. And what we did show, you can see there in the, the red uh, circles, that uh, vitamin D production in, and, and content of the egg was up to 43% higher uh, when, you fed, when we fed vitamin D uh, to the hens at the European Food Safety Authority limit. So this, uh, might I add, was le levels of vitamin D that were within uh, European food safety standards. This was very exciting um, because it led the company to enrich their um, mainstay brand, Happy Egg, which is one of the main free range brands in the UK. Um, this brand uh, is, uh, the, the, the amount of vitamin D is 30% more, um, and it is very impressively at no additional cost to the consumer. We also went on to uh, get more funding from Innovate UK to try and see if we can roll vitamin D egg enrichment out more widely, not just within the business, but uh, within the egg sector more, more generally. And we've been working closely with the British Egg Industry Council to explore the potential for more widespread enrichment with vitamin D. So we have a project which is ongoing at the moment. It's a 12-month project, and sadly, it's been a, somewhat impacted by the, the COVID-19 scenario. Um, but the project itself is divided into four work packages. Uh, we want to assess whether or not there are changes in the vitamin D content of eggs when we uh, cook them and store these eggs. We wanted to explore whether or not consuming these eggs has an impact on your blood vitamin D level. So can it be protective of vitamin D deficiency during winter time? And the last two work packages, really important work packages are around consumer attitudes and understanding to these food products. Uh, and then the market opportunity. So this work is ongoing. So unfortunately, uh, I don't have uh, any results to present uh, just yet, but certainly uh, watch this space. Um, there's also been quite a lot of interest about vitamin D in relation to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and that stems from the fact that uh, vitamin D is, is well known to have an important role to play in the immune system. What we do know is that if your blood level is below 25 nanomoles per liter, and that's about one in five people in the UK, uh, it's well known that that in does increase your risk of uh, getting a respiratory tract infection. However, what's less clear is whether supplements actually reduce the risk of um, COVID-19. There's just not enough evidence yet. So I was part of a consortium in the UK of vitamin D researchers, which uh, wrote in the BMG about this uh, literally about a month ago. Um, and we came up with a number of recommendations, take home messages um, that are important for people. These recommendations are summarized on the slide, but they're reiterating a lot of the messages that I've already said, um, that it's really important that people consume supplements uh, in low dose supplements of 10 micrograms per day, in addition to normal uh, dietary sources. And might I add that um, high dose supplements are certainly not recommended. So uh, doses above 20 to 25 micrograms are certainly not recommended because they do uh, increase the risk of uh, toxicity. And finally, just to point out that um, I've done some other work as well recently in terms of um, media exposure uh, as part of the MRC Festival of Medical Research. Um, so there's a link there from the, the SEMA website, which is a center of musculoskeletal aging between Newcastle, Sheffield and Liverpool, uh, if you'd like to get some further information. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, again, a, a, another fascinating presentation. And um, just in the interest of time, I think if we, again, if you've got questions, just pop them in the chat. For now, we're going to take a very, very quick break. So we'll just give a couple of minutes, the perfect time to go and get a refill and a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Um, and then join us back in two minutes. Don't leave the call. Um, just stay on. Um, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes um, to be able to carry on with our next presentation from uh, Professor George Leitz. Okay, so we'll give a couple of minutes and we'll start up again at about quarter past 11. Um, again, perfect time to go and get a cup there.
Okay, everyone. So a very, very quick break, but hopefully you've all had a chance to get a cup of coffee just like me. Um, I think we'll we'll just get started again. Um, so I think we can see that um, George is ready to go. Um, so I'll just hand straight over. So the next talk is going to be from Professor George Leeds. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, just kind of like a, just a very quick introduction, just to kind of like who I am. I'm a professor for international nutrition, so I'm kind of like very much interested in terms of what happens worldwide, uh, and particularly also what happens in middle to lower income countries in relation to nutrition. Uh, and kind of like when it comes to COVID, as you can imagine, uh, particularly lower and middle income countries are actually extremely badly affected by by this outcome of the uh, of the pandemic. And um, uh, currently, we can like see a massive change in nutritional intake due to the fact that um, the uh, supply chains for various foods are very badly affected. And also, we see a, a real reduction of what we call healthy foods due to the fact that uh, people can't really access them easily uh, as, as potentially we can. So can, like, there's a massive change, as you can imagine. Uh, in that regard. What I would like to talk to you about today is kind of like another vitamin uh, that I've been working on for a very long time and, and vitamin A is, a is like vitamin D, a very interesting vitamin because it fulfills a re relatively wide range of different functions. And that is that um, we know vitamin A mostly for its function in, its, um, in, in vision because be without vitamin A we can't see but it also plays a really important role as a hormone because it's really important when it comes to cellular differentiation. It's important when it comes to fertility, but it's also really important in relation to immune responses. And about the immune response, we come back to that in, a, in the next slide as to kind of like, you know, why it suddenly became such an important vitamin for public health. But the question also is kind of like, where do we get this vitamin from? And you can see here that there are actually two main sources. One is that we can get it from animal sources as the vitamin itself. Um, and we can also get it from fruit and vegetables. And here we have particularly things like uh, dark green leafy vegetables, but also uh, fruits and, and other vegetables that actually are very good sources for this, for this vitamin. In the UK, about a quarter of the vitamin A comes from our kind of vegetable sources on average. Um, uh, but in developing countries, due to the fact that kind of like animal foods are very much less available due to prices and other reasons, uh, people there have to rely on plant foods as to over 80% uh, of their dietary intake for vitamin A. Why is it so important? Well, there kind of like are various reasons for that, but the most important reason why vitamin A has been in the agenda for, I would say the last 20 to 30 years is because it has been identified as an important vitamin for helping us to reduce mortality, particularly in the very young, i.e. children that are below the age of five. And we see here that we can reduce mortality by just simply making sure that we reduce uh, vitamin A uh, deficiency in children uh, by up to 24%. And that's been shown in a variety of various studies. Um, the WHO has introduced a scheme of giving our vitamin A capsules to children that are in areas where we have vitamin A deficiency. And that has been extremely successful. One of the best and, and, and most widely used success stories of the WHO of trying to reduce deficiencies worldwide. Um, but there are two areas in the world that are unfortunately still remaining uh, as being problematic and that's Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where it's kind of still a lot of work going on trying to address these problems. What we are particularly interested in here in Newcastle was the, the question as to if you start giving people supplements or if you ask them to change their diet and to incorporate these foods, why is it that people react so differently? What is the reason as to why we see this massive variation? And in fact, what we do see, whether or not it's supplements or whether or not it's dietary changes, is that we see up to a, a variation of someone responding or not responding to the diet is up to 60%. It's absolutely massive. And we want to understand what's the underlying factor. Is it, is it the absorption that is different or is it the ability to use the 
the plant sources as a source of vitamin A because they only can become vitamin A when you convert them to the active molecule in your intestine or in your body. So we did a couple of studies and we looked at whether or not genetic variability plays a role in this, i.e. are there differences in people that are able to convert? And in fact, they are. We actually identified two different genetic traits that have shown that actually there are differences um, in the way we can actually make vitamin A from these sources. Now, when we kind of did the first couple of studies, we gave really large doses and we want to know, kind of like, is this really relevant uh, in terms of the general population as to kind of like what actually happens? And more importantly, are there certain population groups that are more affected? Um, and if we can like start looking at the genetic variations that you actually see in these things, what you can like see here on the graphs on the left hand side is the first polymorphism that we found in the gene. And we see very nicely that the C variant, uh, which is the kind of like the most productive way of making vitamin A from precursors, actually is extremely high, particularly in population groups in Africa or African descent. Whereby the second one that we found is extremely high in, uh, for example, Asian groups. So there are certain traits that are higher in certain population groups than others. And that may be important because it may mean that some population groups may need more of the uh, precursors to make up the needs that they actually have for these particular vitamins. Now, the question that we then ask ourselves is that, how wide is this inter-individual variation? And what you see on the graphs here on this slide is that um, we're looking at how easy it is for someone to absorb a very defined dose of beta carotene, which is a vitamin A precursor. And how easy is it to make the vitamin from that precursor? And on the left hand side, you see here uh, beta carotene on the x axis and retinol palmitate on the y axis. And that is kind of like the more vitamin you make from the beta carotene, the higher the concentration on this graph the more you absorb of the precursor, the higher concentration on this, this graph. And what you see here is quite staggering. These are actually people from the Newcastle area that we've tested in two subsequent studies. And you see that a large amount of people do not really absorb beta carotene effectively and also do not convert it effectively into vitamin A. And I call, or we call them the low responders or sometimes even the no responders. Then you see people that absorb beta carotene very effectively but they do not seem to convert it very much. And they obviously absorb the precursors very effectively, but don't really convert them effectively. And then otherwise, you have those that absorb and convert really effectively. So in fact, actually, you can like see this typical uh, funnel response indicating that you actually really have three different groups. And the question is, can we actually easily determine this in an individual? And the answer to that is yes. What we do give them actually is a very defined dose and we check them over time and you see here very nicely that if the retinol that was made from the beta carotene is very different from the reference retinol that we gave them, then you actually have a low responder. If it's very close, you actually have a high responder. So you can actually determine whether or not there are differences between people in that way. What we did want to find out, however, is can you actually make someone respond better with time? Can I kind of give them a higher dose? If you can like expose them to a higher intake, uh, can they actually kind of become better in terms of being able to convert? And the answer to that is yes, they can. If you can like look at people that were low responders and we put them on a supplement of seven milligrams of beta carotene over, two, uh, over a two months period, or 60 days, we actually see that people responded in becoming better in terms of converting uh, the, the carotene. And also the question was then raised, if I, for example, have a polymorphism, is my, is my total body store or the vitamin A that I have in my body somewhat lower? And the answer to that was yes. Can I actually make more of that uh, if I have a specific genotype? And the answer to that is also yes. We can actually use supplements to actually increase our vitamin A stores. Well, the important thing here is that uh, even though we've showed this with supplements, the supplements were used at a concentration that are very much easily achievable by diet. And that means that by dietary means, we can actually 
uh, increase vitamin A status very, very effectively. So what these kind of like studies really have shown us is that more importantly, uh, to remind us that vitamin A is a really important source, particularly also for our immune system. Like Tom mentioned, vitamin D, vitamin A, and vitamin D actually are playing a, a, a brother and sister role. Very often the genes that are important in terms of regulating immune responses are driven by both vitamin A and vitamin D. So they're both really, really important when it comes to the immune system. We also know that deficiency is widespread, like vitamin D, vitamin A deficiency is very widespread. And we also see that in the UK even, we have what, what I call marginal vitamin A deficiency, not clinical, as we see in low and middle income countries, but definitely marginal vitamin A deficiency. There is large variation between people in terms of how they respond to either a dietary change or a change in taking supplements. And these are kind of like various reasons by a difference in the absorption, but also the difference in, in the ability to make vitamin A from these precursors. Uh, we know that some genetic factors can affect those variations, but we also have seen now from our studies that these variations can be overcome by consuming a little bit more of these precursors, which is of course a really important uh, question that vegetarians will ask themselves in terms of particularly those that actually do not consume animal foods, which are rich in the preformed vitamin A that we find in the diet. So I just kind of would like to kind of acknowledge also kind of like the, uh, the teams that are really important in terms of making these research work and making them possible. And that's the team at Newcastle University, in particular here, uh, the, uh, the team that was responsible for running those studies, in particular here, Dr. Anthony Oxley, who's kind of like been responsible for running those trials. But then also we, we've had a lot of teams around the world that helped us during these kind of trials. And here it's Penn State University that have helped us to, to analyze um, the, uh, the data by using very clever mathematical modeling together with DSM that enabled us to kind of use the supplements and funded some of our studies. So that's um, the end of this, the, uh, the presentation. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much, George. Um, we should have time for, for hopefully one, maybe one or maybe two questions. So if anyone has a question for George, if they want to raise their hand um, using that virtual function. Uh, we've got one from Bernie, right? <clears throat> Would a normal eye test identify or indicate a need for keratin? Yes, Bernie, that's a really good question. What normally happens is that when you have a lack of vitamin A, and um, what happens normally is that you um, will start realizing this when you actually start walking in twilight. So normally when you, for example, go out for a walk and you go out in the twilight, either in the very early morning and, or kind of like, you know, very late at night in the summertime, uh, you will start seeing the path in front of you very, very faintly. And we call that night blindness, even though it's not really night, but it's kind of like the not ability to see in very dim light. Uh, and that is a very clear sign or a clinical sign of vitamin A deficiency. Uh, so you're right that uh, the eye is a, is a relatively good indicator for not having sufficient amount of vitamin A, but that is already, I would say, at the kind of like lower end. So we see this very often in women that are actually going through pregnancy uh, that suddenly become night blind, but then when pregnancy is over because of the demand of vitamin A for the fetus is somewhat really draining their sources, but then they kind of like regain them. Uh, so it disappears, but we also see it uh, in, in, in children and, and, and women that actually just simply do not consume enough, in particular in lower middle income countries. Night blindness hasn't really been described in the UK for a long time, but we shouldn't forget that at the time of my parents and, 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 and our grandparents, we actually saw vitamin A deficiency in the UK. And the only reason that we've got rid of it in the UK is because we had started to fortify foods such as margarine and so on. So it's a, it's, yeah, it's a really important question that kind of like we, we kind of like forget that vitamin A deficiency was a big problem in the UK, but it's not a big problem in the moment due to the fact that we have fortified foods. Thank you.
Great, thanks very much. Um, and one more question from Sue Underwood. Um, hi, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, does the way you cook, for example, the vegetables affect the amount of um, vitamin intake? That's a very good question. And I'm kind of really grateful for that question because what many people don't really understand is that cooking actually very often helps the absorption of nutrients and particularly when it comes to the precursors. Uh, because if, for example, you were to take a carrot and you were eating it like it is, you would absorb not even a percent of the nutrients from that carrot. If you were to make it into a salad, i.e. you would wrap it, and you would give it some salad sauce, that increases already. But it increases even much further if you were to cook it because you're destroying the protein that capture the carotene in the plant and therefore you can release them much easier and effectively in your, in your gut. So therefore you increase the absorbability. What does happen to a slight extent is that we see what we what chemists call an isomeration so we can like see a slight change in the molecule that make it less uh, active but that change due to the thermic process of cooking is very minimal in comparison to the gain that you have because of the absorption so cooking really does help us to gain more from foods doesn't always apply to every nutrient so you have to be careful to not overcook vegetables when it comes to B vitamins because they can leak out and some of them actually even get destroyed by, by heat. So you have to kind of take a good balance, but cooking normally is good for us. So it's a kind of, that's to me the kind of the take home message. There were some really interesting questions there. Um, so we're gonna move on now to our, to our last speaker um, for the day. And I don't know how we've gotten around to that so quickly, um, but uh, for our last speaker, we'll be hearing from Professor Emma Stevenson. Thanks, Charlie. Can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Yeah, great. Fantastic. So um, just a quick introduction about myself. So I'm a professor of sport and exercise science um, in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at Newcastle and also the Deputy Dean of the Population Health Sciences Institute in the faculty. Um, I'm also very involved in, in two research centres that focus on uh, human nutrition and the interaction between nutrition um, and activity in our centre for healthier lives. So I'm going to talk about protein today and why protein is really important um, for healthy aging. So we know that a balanced and optimal protein energy homeostasis is recognised as a major dietary related determinant of healthy aging. Um, and we also know that throughout the aging process, we start to, to lose muscle. Um, we start to lose muscle. This then leads to, to frailty, increased falls, less um, independence. Um, so it's really important that we focus on trying to offset or prevent um, losing muscle through a negative net muscle protein balance throughout the aging process. And when I talk about healthy aging here, I am talking about aging throughout the life course. This is not just something that's important once you reach a certain age. Maintaining a good protein um, amount in your diet and keeping active is really important throughout the life course. So currently we do have recommendations around protein intake in our diet. Um, you know, there's a value there, 0.75 grams per kilogram body mass per day, which really isn't particularly useful for most individuals as a recommendation. We like to talk obviously about what that means in terms of real foods and how much protein you can get at different points throughout the day. But that's, that's the current recommendation. Um, but there is um, quite a, a lot of evidence that would suggest that actually as we, as we get older, we may need more protein in our diet. Diet, but as yet the recommendations do not look into or do not account for, for age. Because of this protein amount for the source of protein in your diet and the timing of ingestion of protein um, are really, really important things to consider and have been the focus of a lot of research over the last few years, um, looking at these different aspects around timing, different amounts of protein and where we actually get protein in our diet from. 
So this is just a very, very simple um, diagram to try and explain what happens across the day. And this happens to all of us that we go through um, this, this um, sequence of times when um, we have a, ne a negative protein balance, which are the, the bits labeled B on this diagram, um, and positive protein balance. And what we want to achieve is that the A bits are bigger over the day than the B bits. And this will stop us from starting to, to lose muscle mass. So to stimulate protein synthesis, that happens when we eat, when we eat protein, um, and also when we exercise. And actually the combination of exercise and consuming protein will stimulate muscle protein balance positively um, in a greater way than just exercising or just eating protein alone. So that's why we're very interested in this combination of activity, but also getting enough protein into your diet at regular points throughout the day and i'll come back to it but actually that regularity of consuming protein throughout the day is really important it's not just about getting all your protein at once in one meal but getting lots of little amounts of protein throughout the day is really really helpful to try and maintain that positive protein balance throughout the day so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project that we led from Newcastle called Protein for Life. Um, and this is just a, an infographic which kind of just sums up what we were trying to achieve with Protein for Life project. So as I've said, protein in the diet is really important to, to either slow or, or prevent this loss of muscle mass, which is, you, you may have heard the term sarcopenia, um, which is the loss of muscle mass and strength related to aging. But actually, when we start to look at what's available for individuals, we actually are failing to meet the needs, certainly in the types of food products that are available, available commercially um, for, for older adults. And what we found is that one third of adults over the age of 50 actually don't consume enough protein in their daily diet. So what Protein for Life was all about was about bringing academics who work in this area together with the food industry to try and work together to, to um, create some solutions. So this project was funded through um, a, a scheme called Priming Food Partnerships. Um, and this was funded through the, the four main research councils in the UK who fund um, research. And the whole point was to bring people together with very different backgrounds um, to try and have this multidisciplinary approach to public, to this public health issue, um, but also have the, the input and support from, from industry, which was really, really important. So the, the research question for Protein for Life was very simply, how do we maintain a healthy protein intake um, in our aging population? And as part of this, we had to, to get the support from at least two industry stakeholders. Um, and as you can see from this slide, we actually had the support of seven different industry stakeholders on this project. So it just shows what a really important aspect of, of food production and diet that this is. Um, and you can see that you may recognize some of the names, but Sainsbury's in particular, it was fantastic to have a retailer involved in this project. So really understanding consumers, understanding what happens when we go into the supermarket and make those food choices, um, like Alison already um, talked about this morning. So these are a mixture of, of food producers. So um, it, the likes of, of Nestle, Pladis makes snack foods, Premier Foods, Bradgate Bakery, um, a lot of tinned and, and packaged goods that we would routinely buy in the supermarket. So what we wanted to do was basically to try and gather as much evidence as possible from lots of different approaches um, to better understand protein intake and also decision making um, in older adults. And I say older adults there, but um, this was from the age of, of 40 plus. Um, so now that I'm 40, I'm not going to say that's older adults, but um, you know, this is looking from midlife to through to later life and trying to understand why people make certain food choices um, throughout, throughout the day and in their shopping and, um, and their cooking. What we also wanted to understand was where are the constraints? So, you know, it's very well us saying, well, we need to try and get more protein into the foods that we eat on a regular basis, but there are some real constraints in terms of manufacturing and um, how protein affects the taste of certain foods, the texture of certain foods, um, and how full they may make you feel as well. So all really important points to consider based from what we know from academic literature, but also from an industry perspective in terms of food production. 
And what we wanted to then do was to try and use all the outcomes from Protein for Life to work with the food industry to think about what types of foods could we maybe get a little bit more protein into or how can we better um, produce or market or supply foods that have protein in them that are cost effective, that, that taste nice, and that people are realistically going to consume on a regular basis. And then very importantly was then to disseminate all the findings of our, our research to all the key stakeholders that, that we could um, reach, including members of the public, government, etc. So just to share some of the, the very, very high level outcomes of this project, there was a huge amount of data that, that we um, produced. Um, but overall, we did really see that there was a poor understanding of, of the protein needs for healthy aging from a, from a lot of different aspects. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think that protein is for um, you know, young people who are going to the gym or the bodybuilders, and they're the ones that maybe need more protein. Yes, they do. But actually, protein is really, really important um, throughout the aging process very much focusing on real food. So we didn't want this to be about developing protein shakes or, or protein, um, high protein supplements, but actually how can we get protein from real foods that, we, that we'd realistically consume on a day-to-day -day basis? As I said, things like cost, portion sizes, how we can store the, the food, ease of preparation, all were very, very important in some of the focus groups that we, we ran. Um, and what we, we found, that not all, but many older adults did really need to have that support to di diversify their diet. And obviously we looked at different socioeconomic groups and different um, geographical groups as well. Um, and it really did show us that, that, that we do need to have um, support and education around the importance of protein intake um, in healthy muscle aging. I didn't want to bombard you with graphs and figures, but I'm just including this one figure that showed um, from, from some analysis that we did from a national survey um, of, of diet and nutrition. And this just basically shows when people are consuming protein throughout the day. Um, and this is in, in older adults, but it very clearly you can see that people tend to consume protein in their main meal of the day. Um, so very, very little at breakfast and very little um, kind of as snacks throughout the day. So this then showed us that there was opportunities here to try and think about different eating episodes in the day when people could actually consume a little bit more protein, as I said right at the beginning, that that little and often throughout the day is far more beneficial than consuming all your protein, maybe just in one meal, either at lunchtime or in the evening. So I said one of our key um, um, aspects of this was to try and get this a bit more on the agenda and, and reach out to important stakeholders. Um, and we were actually lucky enough to develop this white paper. Um, this is the, the picture of the front cover of the white paper, um, which we actually presented at the um, Parliamentary and Scientific Committee at the Houses of Parliament to really get this on the agenda at government level to say that government Government, industry, consumers um, and, and academics, we need to work together to try and be innovative in how we develop new food products, how we educate people um, and really get the message across that this is a very, very important aspect of diet. So key take home messages really for me is that um, it really is important to try and consume protein regularly throughout the day rather than just consuming your main protein sources at one meal of the day. If you are exercising, which I hope everyone is, and trying to keep physically active, um, it doesn't necessarily mean structured exercise, but any form of physical activity is excellent for, for muscle strength and health. But actually consuming some protein after that, that exercise session or that activity session will really help to support muscle metabolism. So the, getting the timing right throughout the day um, really helps as well. Protein intake can be in the form of both plant and animal based sources and we're going to break off into some discussion groups in a second to talk about how we might get different sources of protein into our diet. So this is not just about having to eat loads of chicken breasts or loads of, of, of fish to get protein. There's lots of ways that we can get protein into our diet. But importantly, we do need to think about the needs of different population groups in society. Yes, we can give recommendations, but actually we want to try and 
think about how we can prepare uh, and provide foods for different population groups within our society. So whether that's people living alone, whether that's people living with big families, people in care homes, etc. So it's, it's not as simple as just saying we need to eat more protein. And it's been a fantastic opportunity and a real learning experience for me working very closely with the food industry. And this is really important that the research that we do as academics is then translated into kind of real actions um, and they can use that research to really inform their development of new products or reformulation of, of foods and products. So as I said, we're going to take a little bit of time um, for, for discussion. So Charlie's going to put us into, into different breakout groups to have a, a bit of a chat um, in smaller groups, just thinking about how, from your own experiences, how might you help people um, or what might help people to incorporate enough protein into their daily diet. So thinking, do you individually, do you consider protein when you're making food choices? Um, and what do you think makes it easier or more challenging to consume protein regularly? So it's just an opportunity to think about your own experiences and maybe share some of those with others in the group. And just to make it a little bit more simple, we're, we're splitting this up into different kind of eating episodes. So a couple of breakout rooms will focus on breakfast ideas, um, a couple on snacking throughout the day and a couple on, on main meals. Here's some examples. I'm not going to dwell on this because I want you to come up with some of the, the protein um, foods in, in the discussion groups, um, but this will be available to, to people after the presentation. Thank you. Very good. So I'm going to quickly move you all into little rooms just so you, so I, like Emma says, so you can just have a smaller chat in a little group. Um, there will be someone in every single group who will be able to look after you and we'll have those questions. You don't have to try and memorise it all yourself, don't worry. There will be someone there to look after you. Um, you'll only have 10 minutes to have a bit of a chat and then we'll bring you back in for a quick little bit of feedback. <coughs> so you shouldn't have to do anything, so I will put you all into the rooms now. So I think everyone is back in the room now, hopefully. Um, so if you haven't already, if you could put your microphones back on mute as you come back in. Um, hope you enjoyed those breakout rooms. Just to finish off, it would be good if we could get a couple um, of people to be able to, to, uh, to feed back um, on one of the things that they talked about, about some of their meals. Um, so I don't know, just using the hand raise function, if anyone who spoke about um, breakfast um, would like to share some of the things that they talked about in their rooms. Hi, Charlie. I don't know how to hand raise, sorry, but shall I feed back <laughs> from our breakfast room? That would be great, yeah. Um, yeah, we had a lovely chat. Um, I think we were saying that um, kind of knowing how much protein to have was a, was a big challenge and kind of education is one of the, 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 the biggest things that we could be doing. Um, we also talked about the um, information on, on um, we had people that were lactose intolerant and um, people that are on plant-based diets and knowing um, what the information is on a, on a box of food to try and figure out how much protein there is against all the other things in that traffic light, salt and fat and sugar and um, all those kind of things. We're saying we're often pulled to the information about the bad things and not the good things like protein. So basically the message from our group is more information um, and more education and I suppose events like this really help to inform us. Emma, have you got anything you'd like to, to feed back on what was said there? Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of our major outcomes that education is really, really important. Um, and there is a real lack of that still. We, we, in, our, in our room, we were, we were talking about how um, you know, things like the retailers have responsibility and, and food producers around just the way that foods are packaged, how it's marketed, that you know, it's very much that protein is about um, you know, for, for young males. Um, and so there's a real responsibility, um, which is why we were trying to get it kind of on the agenda at government level to say that this is a very, very important health message and we need to think about different groups. So as, as um, Cassie has mentioned, we, we had people in our chat room who are dairy intolerant. Um, you know, there's more people who are vegetarian and vegan now. So lots of, of opportunities there actually, but you know, for, the, for the food producers and, and retailers. 
um, but it is about getting those important health messages across to, to say that, you know, that little and often a protein is very, very important in the diet. So we had some really nice ideas around um, you know, adding things like nuts and seeds to porridge at breakfast or for snacking, um, you know, using yogurts and dairy and things like that throughout the day to try and just add a little bit of protein at, at regular intervals to, to different meals um, and try not to just focus on, for example, just chicken as a, as a protein source. So you can get protein from plant and animal based sources and combinations of those in the diet is fantastic. Mm. Um, Clement, I can see that you've got your hand up there. So if you want to go ahead and, and maybe comment on some of the things you talked about in your group, um, you may need to unmute yourself. Cause... Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Um, unable to unmute you there. Um, Bernie, I can see you've got your hand up as well, if you'd like to comment. Yeah, um, we um, covered breakfasts, and I think the outcome was that whilst we know good food and seemed, you know, we, we uh, all used good food, we still had no idea of our intake of protein. And yeah. I think it's a very difficult thing to estimate except Janice came up with a very good point, which was in our group, which was that we don't um, maintain, uh, keep protein in the body and it's lost. So there isn't the fear of having too much protein in the system. I thought that was interesting. Um, Clement, I can see you've unmuted yourself there. So if you want to yeah. go to you now. Yeah, most of it's been repeated. Uh, I was fortunate that I could work out my body mass index and uh, use that as a multiplier to tell me what my daily dosage is. And I think the, the point to be made, um, what really constitutes the 25 grams I should have per day uh, in terms of protein? And it's trying to find that. I didn't realise that before. That's now given me some idea the next stage really is to find out, well, what's the best use of that 25 grams? Great. Um, I'm just conscious of time there, so I don't know if, if anybody else has any other comments that they would like to be able to mention, do please type them and put them in the chat um, because we will be saving the chat and sending that off to the presenters with any further questions, comments that haven't been responded to. Um, but I don't want to run over too long. So Emma, I don't know if you've got any final comments on what's been said there. Right, could I just come in, Charlie? Um, there were two questions that actually maybe Emma can actually address. Uh, one question was, how soon after exercise should protein be consumed? And the other one was, uh, does protein later in the day help with sleep? Um, so yeah, I've just actually answered that question on the chat, but to the first question about after exercise. So um, very briefly, as soon after exercise as is possible um, is, is ideal. So um, there's kind of a window of opportunity after your exercise session um, where your body will be kind of primed, ready to, to metabolize the protein. So as soon as you can after exercise, some people find it quite difficult to eat after an exercise session. So, you know, if it's if it's half an hour or so later, but um, to get the most benefit would be to consume straight after after um, exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so um, there's some very interesting research around protein and sleep, particularly casein protein. Um, so, you know, the, the protein that you find in, in or one of the proteins that you find in milk. And actually, it kind of goes back to that, uh, probably what, what we were told when we were young by our grandparents, things about having a, a cup of milk before bedtime can help you to sleep. And actually, there's some really good evidence now that shows that casein um, as a kind of nighttime protein, um, may help with, with, with sleep quality, um, but also casein is a slow release protein. So it's, it is a good protein to consume before bedtime because you get this slow release of the amino acids in the protein throughout the night. Um, so, so yes, that's an emerging area around you know, sleep quality and protein intake, but, um, but yeah, certainly can have some benefits. Right. Um, 
So like I say, I'm just a little bit conscious of time there because I know some people are going to have to get away. So any other further comments or questions do include in the chat. Um, but, but other than that, um, just a massive thank you to everyone for joining today. Thank you. And, and again, a massive thank you to all our presenters for some really, really interesting talks there. Like I said at the start, this has been recorded. So if you do want to rewatch it, you'll be able to go back and see it at a later date. Um, and we'll try and get some of those questions from the chat answered as well. Um, you'll probably be sent an evaluation in the next few days just to let us know what you thought about today. And it'd be great if you'd be able to fill that out for us, just because it gives us an idea of what we can improve on, what we did well, so that for the next one, we can do it a bit better as well. Um, but other than that, thank you so much, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.